morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us this morning for uh, this session about uh, diversified development. Um, we're uh, very uh, um, honored and thankful for uh, Ivailo, who is uh, passing through uh, uh, London uh, to, uh, to be with us today and uh, to talk about a, a theme that, uh, uh, that is um, um, at the center of, of interest, uh, mm, mm, of not only of policymakers, but many of us working uh, uh, in emerging markets, but also in academia, looking at uh, sort of process of economic diversification in uh, natural-based uh, resource uh, countries. And um, uh, Ivailo uh, uh, is the um, uh, practice manager for macroeconomic and fiscal uh, issues at uh, the uh, World Bank. He has a long-standing experience in many of these countries uh, uh, that are resource-rich, um, uh, uh, particularly in, uh, uh, in Europe and Central Asia, but not only. And um, uh, along with his uh, colleagues, he has written a very interesting uh, book um, called Diversified Development, looking at the experience of Eurasia, but also looking at how uh, uh, Eurasian countries have uh, uh, gone about basically the process of diversification. Uh, and he's going to tell us a little bit about what are the less, some of the lessons, at least from a macroeconomic policy perspective, that we can um, uh, 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 take up with, uh, uh, take to. Uh, uh, with us and try to think in terms of what applies either for Africa or the Middle East, particularly in an environment where commodity prices um, are uh, extremely volatile and the focus now is more on the path of uh, structural reforms uh, rather than at the volatility of oil price in when assessing basically macroeconomic performance and prospects. So thank you again, uh, Ivailo, for being with us and uh, um, the floor is yours and then we'll open uh, the, um, uh, the floor for discussion. So thank you very much, Alia. Thank you, uh, thank you friends, for uh, to coming to this event. Um, I have I have a lot of slides, but I'm, I'm, I'm just going to go through very few of them. But before that, perhaps I just outline what our main point is here. And you know, we I come from a tradition working for the World Bank of being development economists. We look at paths for development. And so in this case, I'm going to talk a little bit about Eurasia, the former Soviet Union, especially the resource-rich countries, and a bit about resource-rich Africa. It's going to be a bit distinct. I'm going to talk first about Eurasia and then about Africa. And, um, and if, if, if you've been, and you have been, obviously, around resource-rich economies for some time, you know that the key word is diversification. Policymakers, economists, everybody else seems obsessed about diversification of these economies. And by that, what is meant is diversifying the structure of exports. We're exporting too many commodities, we need to export more. Or the structure of production. We're producing only oil and gas, we need to produce much more. And there is a ton of work uh, that governments are putting into it. Countries have spent billions. Saudi Arabia is building a new city. <coughs> Kazakhstan is trying to, to do many things. And with, with, with our work, which uh, is not necessarily the very first time this idea has come across, but uh, is certainly one of the few times, we, we are making the point that countries should not worry too much about diversifying what they export or diversifying what they produce. Because governments don't have a direct lever. You cannot manipulate what you can export or what you can produce. But what you can actually diversify are the components of your national wealth, the things that go into the production of uh, annual outputs. And this is your natural capital, physical capital, infrastructure, roads, machinery, and equipment, human capital, the skills of people, and most importantly, the quality of institutions for markets, for governments, and for companies. And so this is, this is one of the key measures. For us, this changes profoundly the way we approach uh, our discussions with governments, rather than looking at simply let's build investment promotion zones, let's build customs free zones, let's, uh, let's focus precisely on what we can do to do more on the export side. We actually are saying, look, your main focus, especially if you're a resource rich country, has to be on the quality of institutions. What institutions? I can sum these up in three uh, items. One, manage volatility. Not reduce volatility, not eliminate volatility, manage it. 
resource-rich countries, Australia, Canada, United Kingdom, United States, have been managing volatility for years. They live with it. Prices are volatile. Gasoline prices are go up and down. Nonetheless, these economies have the markets, have the depth of institutions to, to manage this, uh, this volatility. The second type of institution, uh, institutions are those that ensure a uh, level playing field for companies. I mean, typically in resource-rich countries, there is a capture by whether it's uh, oil producers, whether by uh, agents related to these oil producers. And it is very difficult when you say, we want to diversify what we produce. If we take this seriously, then you should make it as easy as possible for new companies that are especially not in oil and gas or commodities to be entering the market. But yet, most of the resource-rich countries in Africa, in the Middle East, in Eurasia, rank very lowly on ease of doing business, on business freedom, anything you want to do with uh, doing business. So there's a huge contradiction between what your intentions are and, and what you do. And finally, it has to be the government institutions that actually provide, you know, help provide education and skills. I mean, Milton Friedman used to say 30 years ago, government is failing completely on, on education. And it is very true that if there is something for governments in, in the Eurasia, in the Middle East, in Africa too, they have to invest heavily in education, because without that, it's going to be very difficult for new talent to emerge that is going to generate these industries into which you want to diversify. So this is pretty much our, our thesis. I'm, I'm going to go very quickly and take you through Eurasia so you see a little bit what I'm saying, then we're going to talk a little bit through Africa. And so Eurasia, here's, here's, here's a way we look at this. I mean, look, look at this chart. Here I'm showing you three developing regions. We've picked 12 countries, a dozen countries each. And we've looked at how do these countries connect to the global economy? How did they integrate with the global economy? In East Asia, it was largely cheap labor. A huge chunk of exports were, during at least the initial phases of uh, of industrialization. This is developing East Asia. This is not Japan, Hong Kong. This is Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, and Vietnam. Uh, did it on intensive. They had they had a lot of cheap labor. That's how they entered the market. Uh, the new member states of the EU, again in the a little bit early stages, it was largely physical capital intensive. This was their predominant factor of production. Didn't have much natural resources. The labor was not cheap. That's how they integrated. Eurasia, former Soviet Union, they have plentiful resources and they have been integrating into the global economy on the basis of these resources. This is, by the way, very similar in Africa, except we're going to see what the differences are. And so we're saying there's absolutely nothing unnatural being integrated into the global economy on the basis of, of these natural resources. We do for comparison uh, in our work that if you bother to work, uh, if you want to, if you want to read, we look at other resource rich economies for comparisons. And we look at the countries of uh, Eurasia here. We've ranked here all countries around the world in terms of per capita endowment of uh, natural resources. We have a database, the wealth of nations. Uh, we look here. And the, the point we're making is that the countries of Eurasia, you look at Turkmenistan comes on the top, then you know, Russia, Kazakhstan. I mean, they are rich, but they're not necessarily the richest in per capita terms, right? So uh, it's, it's going to be very, very similar to, to Africa when I show you later, that Africa is rich, but uh, the richest country in Africa, Gabon, has 2 million people. The, those that have mass, Nigeria, South Africa, and Angola, are much, much, much lower in this ranking on per capita wealth. And so both of these regions, even though they're much in the news on the basis of their natural wealth, they don't have extraordinary natural wealth. As I'm going to say later, though, they're very dependent on that natural wealth, which gives rise to this talk about diversification. And we're asking three questions. Um, so one, have these natural resources been a blessing or a curse? Are they becoming more efficient using them? Because it makes a huge difference. Are governments more efficient using them, or is there plenty of corruption and waste? What is it governments should be targeting when they think about how they want to position the countries relative to these natural resources, and what would count as success. I, I briefly alluded to the, to the three answers I'm going to uh, have. One is that actually even with the latest uh, 
slump in commodity prices since 2014. The countries of the former Soviet Union actually have done fabulously well. On poverty, the development indicators, we can talk a lot about politics, which is a very different story. Uh, they have become more efficient, and that is when you look at what they extract and what they create uh, above ground, they become more efficient. We're going to call these genuine savings. Uh, it has, has turned positive of late, uh, which is not the case, by the way, for, for Africa, as we're going to see later. Uh, they are using resources better, but they're becoming less diversified. Russia is not more diversified. Kazakhstan is not more diversified. It's a very similar picture in Africa. It's a very similar picture in, uh, in, the, in the Gulf countries. When we talk about what we, we should target, I asked, I mentioned earlier that governments are preoccupied with this diversifying exports, and they think they should be having this metric, how diversified our exports are as a metric of success. We think this is a profound mistake for the reasons I outlined. They instead should target productivity, employment, and the ability to manage volatility in the markets. And so therefore, it is the diversification of the components of national wealth. Too much natural resources that must be diversified into human capital, physical capital, institutional capital, as we call it, whether it's entrepreneurial, whether it's markets, uh, rather than worrying about uh, how diversified or not are the experts. Very quickly, here is why upward sloping line, here's why Eurasia has done well on one line, life expectancy, on the other, years in schooling, the, the size of the circles is income. Uh, if we extend it past 2011, I wanted to keep it before the 2014 slump in uh, commodity prices. If we extend it after that, same story. They've done well. Poverty has really come down substantially. Nonetheless, very, very, very concentrated exports. Before the crisis, uh, uh, before the slump of 2014, same, same thing. What they use to integrate with the rest of the world, and especially now with China becoming a much more uh, avid trader with Central Asia and Russia, very concentrated exports um, in commodities. Between them, very little trade in uh, anything else as well. Here's an interesting slide, which I think is, is, is good to put everything in, in perspective. I mean, when we talk about is diversification, economic diversification, diversification of exports necessary for development. I mean, we, we have resource-rich countries that have passed, uh, that have gone through this road. United States, Australia, Can Canada, Argentina, and Brazil, with varied success. Look at the, right, the left-hand side. Uh, since 1870, 150 or so years later, incomes per capita in, GDP, uh, in the US are 10 times, in Australia, Canada, 10 times higher. But the level of um, uh, concentration, or let's say export uh, specialization, uh, is very different. In the United States, the United States produces everything under the sun, so it's a very diversified export structure. By contrast, Australia and Canada have a very concentrated export structure. Nonetheless, they have been able to achieve a degree of success, which, which, is, which is quite extraordinary. Uh, at, the, at the same time, we had Argentina and Brazil being pretty much in the same basket as the US, Australia, and Canada 150 years ago, even probably much better. And they have spent enormous resources, especially in the middle of the 20th century, on trying to promote um, domestic industries trying to enhance uh, uh, competition in their markets, trying to have a more diversified export basket. They haven't succeeded. Argentina and Brazil have gone from crisis to crisis to a very substantial extent because of these government interventions that focus on, on the wrong things, on trying to develop domestic industries that would diversify exports, rather than focus on what I mentioned earlier, diversify the asset portfolio base. Yes? So it was that set group, so you got this Argentina and Brazil. Mm. <clears throat> and again, looking at, uh, mentioned earlier, looking at export concentration, the countries of uh, Eurasia, much more concentrated exports, and despite the, the early progress, so we would have, ex people would have expected, policy makers would have expected that exports would be much more diversified, for the resource-rich ones, uh, on, on the left panel, they are becoming much more concentrated. For the resource-poor, it's a very different story. 
they're much smaller, and so the, the right the downward sloping line uh, lies in, in the right panel. Um, let, let me skip this one. And here's uh, something, I mean, it's not, not a proof necessarily, but we're looking at if diversification is so good for the things politicians care about, of exports, then there should be some correlation between diversification of exports, productivity growth, employment growth, and volatility. I mean, after all, all politicians, whether explicitly through elections or implicitly through some social contract, no matter what the level of uh, authoritarianism in the country, they are expected to deliver on some of these things. They, populations want stable prices, they want jobs, and they want a more productive uh, economies, therefore higher wages. We see no connection between productivity growth and diversification. We see no connection between employment growth and diversification. And we see some connection, very little, between diversification and um, uh, output volatility. Uh, here's the, what I talked earlier about genuine savings, that the country, the, 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 the giving praise, and we're going to see this for Africa later, that you look at these lines, a line above zero means the countries are saving, meaning what they extract up below ground, they are able to convert it into something that has more value above ground, physical capital, human capital. So if you look at the OECD countries, they've been, they've been doing, and these are the resource-rich OECD countries, they've been doing fairly well over time. If you look at uh, the countries from GCC, um, here we're, um, you know, they, they've been broadly doing well all the time. Uh, 1990 is, 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 the, is, the, is the war, uh, and, uh, and I think Kuwait is pulling these things down. But they've been above zero for some time, and only of late, the mid mid 2000s, Eurasia, you see the black line, has started to go up. So therefore, they found a way, despite the corruption, despite the, all all the ways, they found a way to convert capital below ground into capital above ground. This is this is an important metric for resource rich economies. Um, but what what remains the story, what what remains the issue the big issue for 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 Eurasia and it's going to be exactly the same for Africa is that when you look at the structure of wealth and you say well within the structure of national wealth there are tangibles right there are natural resources there are tangibles there is the produced capital machinery equipment buildings infrastructure and then there is everything else let's call it institutional capital the intangibles the things you can't touch and look at the, the look at the structure here the blue the blue bars right uh, show that for the OECD for the resource rich OECD countries these intangibles are much 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 larger within the overall composition of wealth than they are for pretty much everybody else for the GCC for uh, for the Eurasian countries for mix and these are the things you want to emphasize in a resource rich setting these are the things that control volatility these are the things that avoid that that help uh, you avoid the capture of the state or markets by, by powerful interests. These are the things that allow a level playing field so that companies can enter and exit very, very freely. These are the things that ultimately made Australia, Canada, the United Kingdom to some extent. It's a very different setting though, but it's a resource rich economy, made them very successful. How do you measure intangibles? This is pretty much the residual. So when you look at um, you take growth, mm -hmm. project growth, discounts, get the overall uh, picture of wealth, you measure natural resources, you measure produced capital, and it's pretty much the residual of that. Okay. So, coming back to these things, so what matters? The, the infrastructure, the quality of infrastructure, the institutions, and the education. Look at the infrastructure, look at these bars. Eurasia, the resource rich Eurasia, the second set of bars from the top, much shorter bars than East Asia, a, a continent I think, which is relevant. I mean, this is developing East Asia. This doesn't include Japan, Taiwan, Hong Kong. This is, this is China, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam. Much, much, much lower quality of uh, physical infrastructure. Uh, actually, when we look at uh, the quantity and the length of roads, I mean, the quantity is also very weak. So, for example, Russia, the length of roads in Russia, a country with, what, 120 million people, pretty much twice France's uh, population, has uh, length of roads which is only one-fourth. So, the quantity is not very good, and the quality is, uh, is even worse, in, in a way. 
it's very difficult to connect. It has a lot to do, of course, with, with the way the, the country was set up with all these sparse, uh, you know, all these cities around uh, a huge territories with, uh, with sparse population. Um, now, um, you would think that governments, I mean, so given this poor quality of infrastructure, you would think that governments in Eurasia, right, the resource rich Eurasia, this, this middle line, would be investing more. They have plenty of resources, presumably, but they invest only half as much as, as does East Asia. So even though the stock, you know, the, the, the stock of quality, if you will, of infrastructure is low, they are not uh, making it up by investing more. Education, these are pieces, of course. I mean, look what, 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 what a mess it is. Other than Russia, um, Kazakhstan, I mean, we don't have measures for the others. We don't, we don't have measures for the other rich uh, resource rich countries for us, uh, for um, Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. But look uh, how, how, how low the, the, the measures are, sorry, uh, for, for, for the resource rich countries. So, not, not, not good quality of infrastructure, not good quality of education. Partly because not much is spent on human capital, on education and healthcare in these countries, um, and so it, it is very difficult with, with, with these kinds of governments uh, to, 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 to be achieving very good results. Um, we, there is, uh, there is uh, when we look at overall budgets, they do spend, um, uh, they do spend um, a little bit less than, than the resource poor Eurasia meaning Georgia, Armenia, Ukraine, and the others, but obviously spending is a bit more volatile. And obviously fiscal balances that are determined a lot by, by the resource uh, flows are, are quite volatile. Um, here's, here's an interesting way to look at whether fiscal policies have done well. I kept it before the crisis, because after the crisis things change, and I'm going to explain how. Uh, you look at, you want to see whether is fiscal policy procyclical, meaning when your export revenues, oh, sorry, when your commodity revenues increase, do you spend much more of it or you save for a rainy day? And so you see on the horizontal axis we've plotted change in fuel exports uh, for these countries, the main source of export revenues. Uh, and on the vertical axis we've plotted the real change in government spending. So you want the lines to be actually downward sloping, meaning when you get a lot more commodity revenues, you want governments to be saving for a rainy day and not to be very procyclical. In Russia and Azerbaijan, uh, it doesn't seem that that was the case, uh, a bit better in Kazakhstan. Now, after 2011, 12, as commodity prices started to slump, you had this right, decline in um, real fuel exports, then you had very high spending. So these lines actually started to look better. But they started to look better because in bad times, they're trying to spend as much as possible. But I think a good measure is when times are good, are you able to control fiscal policy in a way not to exacerbate the pressures of the economy and manage volatility correspondingly? Uh, lots of weak governance. Uh, the climate for private enterprise. Here I've plotted, you know, the, the components of doing business, regulatory processes um, on one axis, and legal institutions. And you see there's the, 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 the middle bubble, Eurasia, that things have improved uh, of late. There is a bit more to be, I mean, there's quite a bit more to be done. Uh, you see the wide dispersion of uh, rankings on these countries. Clearly, a lot more to be done to, to become to become OECD uh, level, uh, to have OECD level of uh, doing business indicators. And competition, we talked earlier, level playing field, no? Look at uh, how much competition, the competition environment improved, uh, and these are transition indicators from the EBRD, improved in the new mem EU member states, the blue line going up, uh, the other two lines, both uh, resource rich and resource poor Eurasia, not much change in competition. Whether it is the stigma, uh, because when you fail, whether it's the stigma that you're, that you're rich, whether it's the uh, limited opportunity to create companies to enter the market, whether it's the capture of markets by vested interests, it, it is all uh, not in favor of uh, diversified economy. And finally, if you remember my earlier slides when I when I point, uh, showed, uh, let me go back very quickly, when I showed the lack of correlation between productivity, employment, and volatility, and a diversified 
export uh, structure, by contrast, here I have this upward sloping positive correlation between uh, the economic performance, so uh, on the vertical axis, productivity, employment, and volatility, we've put them together into one index, and on the horizontal axis, a measure of economic of diversification, not of exports, but of this wealth portfolio that I discussed earlier, natural capital, human capital, and produced capital. Institutions, it seems, matter, and institutions early in development matter more. Uh, right? I mean, if only countries such as Republic of Congo, Gabon, uh, Nigeria, Angola are able to create these institutions that manage volatility, that create the level playing field, right? that prevent the capture of the state or of markets by vested interests, they will do much better. Uh, but it's it's very difficult, and, and part of uh, you know we as with the World Bank, part of the difficulty of the policy dialogue is okay. You've told us that it's very important early on in the process to have good institutions. But how do you create institutions once these commodity revenues start flowing in, and once these rents are easy to capture? What do we do? How do we do it? Where are the reform champions? And I think each country case is obviously. Uh, separate, but it's, it's the, this is the million dollar question. I mean, so what do you do? Once you've identified that it is the institutions, and the market institutions, the education, what, what, is it that, uh, what is it that you do? So this is, my, this is my story on Eurasia. I don't know whether you want me to go to Africa, or um, you want me to stop here. If we can give, give maybe um, a few, few hints on Africa, yes. would you would like to have... How uh, would you like? Yeah, maybe uh, if you have some slants on Africa, mm -hmm. that would be great, and then we can... Uh, open it uh, to, to discussion. So, I, a little bit on Africa, it's broadly the same um, story to some extent, but there it is even worse in the sense that we do hear a lot about the African continent being uh, rich in natural resources. And it is true that a lot of, whether Eurasia, even MENA, the United States, you saw the issue of the, the shale gas, there must be plenty of resources that haven't been explored, and therefore they don't enter into these uh, in, into these statistics. We, I mean, we, nothing here that is not explored and, to some extent, proven uh, is, is measured. But uh, it is when you, when you look at it here and you look at um, where, where are the large uh, large middle-income countries of Africa, resources in South Africa. Um, Look where it is at close to the bottom of this chart. Angola, somewhere in the middle. Nigeria, uh, you know, at the very bottom of the chart. And so the large middle-income countries of Africa are actually not very resource-rich. There are countries such as Gabon, Congo, you know, Botswana that are much richer, but these are very, very, very small countries. So for them, for the, these resource-rich, Equatorial Guinea. The, the resource rich on their own probably are fine in that sense. For the continent as a whole, and when we look at development, we look at the whole region. What is it that can pull the region out? It is actually the middle income countries that tend to fulfill this job. For every developing region, you look at East Asia, it was middle income East Asia. At the time, Japan, after that, was middle income Taiwan that pulled the region out. In this case, it has to be Nigeria, South Africa, and Angola that have to pull the region out because it's not going to be uh, the smaller countries. But these are rich, not very rich, but, um, uh, and, and here's, here's one example. Uh, uh, the, 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 the little bars uh, are natural capital per capita, right? And these are the regions. Uh, Latin America and Caribbean lack, Europe, Central Asia, uh, next one, MENA, Middle East, East Asia and Pacific, Sub-Saharan Africa much lower natural capital per capita than any of the regions and much lower wealth per capita. So it is a rich region. It is not particularly rich compared, compared to the others. Uh, when I talked earlier about development indicators, has, uh, has Africa done well? Yes. I mean, Africa has, has done very well. I mean, if you look at some of these levels here, average years of schooling on the vertical axis from a very low basis, nonetheless, has done well. Resource rich, resource poor, they've all moved uh, in, in the same direction. Uh, however, you look at poverty, poverty seems to have stagnated. Uh, I mean, essentially, if you look at the, the left one, resource, resource rich Africa, I mean, now we're pretty much back at uh, the levels of the early 2000s. So the last 
here we have only 2011 data because this tend to come late. But so so clearly, if you think about have natural resources been used wisely, maybe maybe the answer is that perhaps not. Right on on, on some of these uh, interesting indicators. We talked about genuine net savings. What you extract above ground, below ground, natural resources, do you convert it into capital? And institutions above ground. The resource-rich Africa is this weekly line that is close to zero and that has fallen uh, below zero of late. So, uh, and as you see, as commodity prices started to decline, these genuine net savings declined as well. Very likely, it's because uh, in this company, one can say, much more corruption. Uh, given the relative scarcity of resources. Uh, but again, huge disparity in these savings. You look at, at the bottom Angola, uh, hugely, I mean, look at what this means. This means that truly 40 per of, of what you extract, 40% of what you extract somehow is dissipated and right? goes somewhere, is not converted into education outcomes, is not converted into physical capital, uh, goes somewhere. By contrast, Botswana on, 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 on the other spectrum seems to be doing much better in uh, South Africa and Nigeria, of course, uh, close to zero. So, huge variation, I think, for, uh, I mean, like Eurasia, for Africa, this is, this is the word of the day. Huge diversity in terms of uh, wealth per capita, huge diversity in terms of development outcomes, similar to uh, Eurasia, very weak on the intangibles, uh, and the concentration of wealth, unlike in Eurasia, where natural gas also played a role in the natural wealth, here is much more, uh, much more in oil to some, to some extent. Um, and when we look at, so it, this is the interesting way to look at this. It is rich in natural resources, but it, we said it's not particularly rich compared to other regions. But how dependent is it? How dependent? How, what is here? We are summing up resource rents as percent of GDP, the commodity exports, and uh, the value added from mining, right? And much more dependent on commodities than are uh, the other resource-rich countries. So not very rich, but very resource-dependent. And I think this, this underlines the need for proper institutions to, to break this linkage or to, to align these two, two components. Um, the, the infrastructure quality, you saw this chart for Eurasia, very similar for, very similar for uh, for Africa, but again, this diversity, right? South Africa on one side, uh, most of uh, most of the other resource-rich uh, countries of Africa on the other. And in in our study that we, we do this study on Africa now, uh, South Africa, Nigeria, Angola, the countries that account for pretty much two thirds of Africa's GDP, are, are and uh, the most resource-rich countries in terms of resources per capita, then weighted by by by, by GDP. Uh, and so, therefore, most consequential for the regions, uh, for Africa's future development sure. prospects. Um, but when we talked earlier, how has Africa done? How has resource-rich Africa done? Uh, I mean, look at the red bars. High resource, high commodity prices. They they didn't grow as fast as the resource-poor Africa. I mean, how can that be? Uh, their exports, even including commodities, uh, the blue line here. I mean, didn't grow that 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 fast. Um, there has been some diversification within exports. So exports, while exports are dominated by the green bar by by, by commodities, there was some diversification within the commodities. And I, I I know you can't see this, but you see this uh, the thing that is not green. These are other commodities. So there is some diversification. It's not necessarily into manufacturing. It's not into agriculture. It's mostly into other commodities. Whether it's into metals, or whether it comes with new discoveries, and so forth. Yes? I mean, only in the first, you know, 2000, 2004, there's a bit of a difference, right? But then look, um, blue, uh, red and blue, red and blue, red and blue. Presentation afterwards. Yeah, alongside the term. Um, 
So we talked earlier about, remember, if you remember, the governments in Eurasia spending less than East Asia. Actually, um, in Africa, this has been a little different, and especially after the HIPIC, you know, this uh, high in debt, uh, high, highly indebted uh, countries initiative that reduced debts, and then the MDRI, multilateral debt reduction initiative. After debts of then both uh, four resource rich and ten or so resource poor countries were reduced, governments had more room to, to spend. So there is a, I, I would think, a welcome pick up, pick up in government investment. The, the, the bad thing, in, in a way, is that if you look here, uh, the resource, uh, the resource poor, the orange bars. I mean, after kind of the MDRI was completed, they have been able to invest much, much more. This, sorry, this is the private sector. After the MDRI was, com uh, uh, was, was completed, the private sector has been investing more than the resource-rich uh, countries. So, I mean, while the governments seem to be doing a little bit more on on the investment side, it is that poor business environment. I think that that that. Um, is that private investment into the resource-rich countries hasn't been as, as, as forthcoming as it has been in the resource poor. Yeah. You know, Tanzania, Ethiopia, um, Kenya have, have done quite well. And uh, interestingly, when you look at spending on education and health, I mean, in terms of percent of GDP, and we know, of course, that uh, percent of GDP is not everything in the world, but uh, resource-rich and resource-poor in Africa, they've, they've done reasonably well. And you look here, education spending, uh, the, the green, between 4 and 5 percent of GDP, these are not bad levels uh, in terms of percent of GDP. We haven't put here that outcomes haven't been particularly good, but at least on, on the spending side, this, uh, this is going. I mean, it, it is a bit interesting. If you remember for Eurasia, these levels were much, much, much lower uh, than here. Uh, then what is the issue again is this doing business environment and see the little the little circle that is pretty much in the lower left quadrant so a lot a lot more on, on doing business on, on doing business remains um, um, if you want to diversify if you want to do things I, I think this is this is probably the, the area for, for most attention so um, in summary, some of the development indicators for Africa have improved from a very low base. It hasn't been due necessarily to better performance among the resource rich. It has been uniform across the board, and actually the resource poor seem to have done uh, well or as well, or even in, in many cases much better. The spillovers, which we actually, looking at Africa, we, we count on huge spillovers from South Africa, Angola, and Nigeria, none, little to none. It's a very, very, very big problem. And so therefore, this integration with the rest of the world in the current environment, and I'm sure you are very, uh, very much in the focus of it, being in London with everything that's happening with technology and uh, all the scare about robots are going to come and take our jobs and the um, reduction of jobs in manufacturing, even though value added has, has remained steady. Uh, so therefore, this process of you know, you know flying geese where foreign investors goes to go to countries with low labor costs. Once costs rise, they move uh, to the next country and uh, they went to Japan, they went to Taiwan, Korea, they went to China. And what is it, two, three years ago, our chief economist at the World Bank was talking about 80 million jobs are going to leave China over the next decade and they have to find a home somewhere where they're going to go. They, and he was hopeful they're going to go to Africa. They haven't gone to Africa. They've gone to the of China, they've gone to South Asia, they haven't gone to Africa, and so there is this huge sense of um, disillusion, yeah, disillusion, and, 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 and actually it, it, is, it is a profound, uh, you know, dissatisfaction, if you will, that uh, to, to, to note that Africa may have missed the boats, and especially now when we talk about the reshoring of manufacturing production and all these tasks being a bit a bit more split, and you're able to print this and print that, and uh, the advent that of uh, yeah, whatever happens to that. But uh, there is a big there's a big problem that there's a big concern that Africa may have missed this opportunity provided by over the last 30, 40 years a very stable international environment. I mean, volatile, but probably low and uh, affordable commodity prices mm, to, 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 to take on this uh, elevator to development. And so without spillovers from these countries in addition to everything else, uh, 
I think we have a big problem. And so for us, uh, the agenda on the commodities, on the commodity countries, remains very tightly linked to the agenda of development for the whole continent, not just for these uh, okay. three countries. Well, thank you, Ivailo, very much for, for this sort of comparison and, and, uh, and the contrast that we see both in terms of sort of uh, the performance but also in terms of uh, that highlight basically also different policy, uh, policy paths. Uh, maybe uh, let me open uh, the room for discussion. Uh, Jan, uh, please. Yeah, uh, yeah, my name is Jan. I'm working with Fidelity International, so an asset management. Uh, I have a question that relates to both Eurasia and Africa. You've identified the number of factors that you think drive development quite effectively, including infrastructure development, strong institutions, strong education, as opposed to just a focus on export diversification and production diversification. Now, how receptive are governments? Depending on the government, depending on the political agenda, depending on where they are in the political cycle, depending on what they want to accomplish, there is a, a grave concern about them that, among them, that well, we've been targeting export diversification all these years, and we have these projects, and we've promised the, the president uh, that we're going to deliver export diversification. Now, um, now you're telling us that actually, oh, don't worry about this too much. Uh, and I think uh, the way we have been uh, the discussing this, and, and in Kazakhstan, the country, I mean, they have been a little bit more, uh, much more receptive than others, uh, the, the, and because they, I, for, for a variety of reasons, they can look a little bit uh, longer term. I mean, I think that the story there is that, look, uh, at the end of the day, do you, where, where, is your, where is your lever? Can you influence? What can you influence? And you can influence education, you can influence quality of institution, you can influence infrastructure. It's very difficult to directly influence um, the, uh, the, the structure of exports. And even when you think of that, so if, uh, when we have projects, uh, even in the World Bank, to do, do something on, 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 on exports, I mean, ultimately, you come back to, well, let's, let's build this uh, industrial zone, a processing zone, but at the end of the day, well, who's going to come here? We need the, the proper institutions. We need some guarantees. We need uh, quality of uh, infrastructure. So th there is a bit of an openness, but I, I, I think this is this is the this is the key issue of the day. How how do we do that? And um, how do you do it? No, I, I think. Th but th this is it. I, I think we, we we keep talking. I mean, for us. Um, I mean, you build it through conditionality sometimes in lending. I mean, I mean, having been at the, yeah. at the bank, I think. I mean, the, the bank can sometimes try and, and put these as essential in terms of, of, of building blocks for, for policies. But if there is, of course, no uh, tools for multilateral institutions to try to, uh, uh, to instill it, but also if there's no demand from the private sector or from the citizen that this is where the agenda should focus, I think it's going to be quite difficult, no? Uh, so now we've gone through a cycle, right? We've, we've gone up and down, and we, we, we're talking to them and said, look, let's take a look. You, you, you've had these initiatives, right? And we had various industrial policies. We have uh -huh. initiatives for diversification. Kazakhstan spent, spent a gazillion dollars on trying to diversify. Let's take a look at what this has accomplished, right? I mean, so let's let's look at what the record is in Saudi Arabia, where they built right another city in the desert. Let's look at the record. What has this uh, accomplished? I think the, the the record is pretty pretty uh, dismal. I mean, it worked, right? I mean, so does industrial policy of this sort work? And sometimes the answer is well, if it is not stacked against your comparative advantages. It, it could, right? I mean, this is what the government should be doing. Uh, 
if it's completely stacked against your advantages of lack of institutions, lack of proper infrastructure and education, clearly it's not going to be working if you're setting up a city in the desert to, to produce microprocessors when you don't have the infrastructure, when you don't have the education. It's going to be very hard to do, hard to do that. And so I, th I think uh, probably we had to go through one cy up and down cycle, right? Uh, one full cycle to, to, to demonstrate that uh, the effectiveness of these measures uh, is, is, is not very high. Okay, very briefly, yeah, then we have two topic. questions. Yeah, three. Uh, yeah. Just answered very briefly, but uh, my question is around uh, the competition from China and lending. Now, Chinese uh, lending has uh, been built out and comes with far fewer strings attached, especially on the government side. Do you see that as a problem going forward? I mean, it is a problem for countries with poor institutions where you don't know, I mean, right? So they're, they're not lending for the, just in general. They're lending for specific projects. Are these projects properly appraised? Are these projects necessary? Can you, can you, yeah, do they fit in the budget? Do they fit in a broader, broader framework? Uh, if you can't afford to pay in the future, would you be comfortable if somebody, right, Chinese SOE takes them over? So in that sense, I mean, have you done these things? If, if, if you've done these things, these things are properly appraised and they fit in the broader framework, perfect. So, but usually, Usually they're not, right? So. At the same time, I fully understand your question, and, and 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 to me, the answer to that is: I mean, when we look at, I mean, so in the context of resource-rich economies, I mean, for, for me, the examples are Australia and Canada. I mean, Australia, a country with what 20 something million people, has export to GDP that are only 25 percent. Huge chunk of that are commodities. A lot of that, uh, of the remaining, is education. So there, it is very possible, having natural resources, having a relatively small country. Uh, to grow largely thanks to domestic demand. This is not only possible, I mean, we, we bring it as a, as a good example to all resource-rich countries. I mean, Norway is a bit too uh, extravagant in, given that it's very small and so forth. But Australia and Canada, 
largely domestic demand uh, driven economies, not not the export paradigm necessary, necessarily. And so, so therefore, there is a lot to be said here about developing these domestic institutions, developing the, uh, the skills of the population that ultimately you're going to be demanding more from, from, from these natural resources. We, I didn't talk about it here, but there is the, the, a, a, an in, interestingly in Kazakhstan at, at some point, uh, the, the governor was thinking about this, but it, it's, all, it's always a, a bit of an issue of um, you have these resources on the ground. Uh, we people or humans, economies, government uh, officials, we tend to be extremely poor in projecting commodity prices in the future. So what is the rationale of taking oil on the ground extracting it to get dollars to keep uh, in London, right, so keep in New York. What is the point of converting this wealth into, you know, financial wealth? Uh, and we, 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 we see that it may be important to, to think of, I mean, you need to extract enough natural resources to the extent you can spend on education, on infrastructure, to have this rainy day fund for counter-cyclical fiscal policy, if you want to have a fund for future generations, but anything above that to build excessive uh, uh, financial resources, we, it, it is not very clear what the purpose of that is, right? And so, I mean, if you somehow knew that commodity prices are about to slump, okay, maybe, maybe you should ramp up production completely and convert all your natural. I mean, in the United States, right? I mean, there is no natural resource fund. I mean, here and there, Texas and you know, um, Alaska have funds, but there's no fund at the central level. There's no fund, I mean, only lately in Australia, this future generations fund. So uh, we, 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 think of, we think of this, I mean, there is a limit, I mean, there's, there's a discussion to be had about how much you extract. If you yeah. cannot That's use, I mean, if you cannot use it for to, to improve the, uh, the skills of your people, so the human capital, cannot use it for infrastructure, what's the point putting it in reserves that you're not going to need? And it's going to be very tempting to use, right, to, to be stolen pretty much. And, and so, and pretty much this encourages that export mentality, right? I mean, oh, we can export ourselves out of, uh, out of any trouble. So, no, I, I, I think it's a very, very good question and observation. Okay. Sorry. Can you please introduce yourself? Okay. 
large hub of South Africa that unfortunately is very poorly connected with the countries uh, around it. And I think uh, until there is a bit more of an integration of, uh, the, or at least there, until there are more spillovers between South Africa and its broader neighbors, right? Uh, I think it's going to be very difficult for, 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 for all of the countries around South Africa to do well. Um, and I don't know necessarily, I mean, it's, you, you hear these anecdotal stories, right? There is uh, cross-border trade, of course, uh, rather informal. There are some migrants here and there. But none of that is in the data. I mean, okay, granted that, yeah. And so, It's a very interesting issue before we move to the last question because this is also the case where basically even if as, as a World Bank economist we're trying basically to isolate and look at these factors as determinants of sort of a good path of diversified development, sometimes there are also external factors whether could, they could be geopolitical or maybe sort of um, uh, uh, policy initiatives that require basically uh, uh, regional intervention, like uh, regional intervention for connectivity, right. that if if they are absent, no matter how well you yeah. do on your sort of list yeah. of your policies that you talked about, yeah. whether institutions, education, etc., there are there could be some external uh, um, uh, um, factors that may 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 not get you to this uh, diversified uh, development path that you want, or may undermine uh, your efforts uh, to do so. That's an interesting example. There was a question there. Yeah. Question is that it is there are discoveries, potential discoveries potential. of gas, but but so might the, as well the weak institution is the biggest concern, right? Biggest concern. So yeah. so uh, who, what where uh, and, and I think it's it's an important question is that is there like examples of countries where that could have done it um, despite the fact that that they have weak institution? I I, I frankly. Uh, I mean, think ag so. again, we default to Australia, Canada, yeah. United States, right? Uh, Norway, that had the institution. I mean, Netherlands had the institutions before discovering natural resources. Yeah, exactly. It's going to be very tough to if do that after, right? Yeah. 
That's that's why I think Lebanon should not should, should hurry not, up should not explore. And I, I, I'm from I think they should not explore. I, but that's a, I'm a, I'm a Lebanese. Maybe that final question. Uh, but that's very good institution. I think it's a, it's an important policy debate. But just on this, I mean, really, what do you do? In a country where you know, I mean, all your attempts at yeah. building institution as an element of important sort of um, um, developmental, uh, basically building block, um, we know for sure that it's 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 out of question to get a positive outcome. So what do you decide to to explore and go the resource uh, uh, the resource sort of uh, uh, rich country's way of exploring and producing, or you say no, actually. It will be counterproductive because it will be productivity uh, diminishing. It will be more uh, corruption, uh, uh, and better not to explore and produce or 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 or, or go the resource sort of. Uh, or just the try to focus on the institutions, right? I mean, yeah. there must be a set of institutions, especially this managing volatility that cuts across, right, the political divides, many political divides you have, or managing volatility, investing in infrastructure. I mean, a lot of these are very non-controversial, yeah. right? I mean, probably the most controversial is a level playing field, right? So that all kind of companies can enter. But how about managing volatility? I mean, yeah, that I think cannot be very controversial, uh, or infrastructure, or, or education. Uh, but the other one on a level playing field, I think this is a tough one. Yeah. Okay, and Hal, final uh, question. Hal, say Egypt and Saudi Arabia, I think, I mean, I, even in the context of resource-rich economies, I mean, what, what do you do along these two dimensions, right? I mean, spend a lot of education, spend a lot on education, educating people, but don't give them opportunities to start companies, to work in other companies other, other than the state sector. It's a big problem. It's either domestic... Not enough competition. Not enough competition. It's either a domestic, uh, tenuous, uh, tenuous domestic environment or, or a brain drain. And so therefore, I think, I mean, they are here the two dimensions for pretty much most of these countries to work on. Spend, 
create these opportunities for people to, to, get to get the education, to get the skills, remove the social stigma of being entrepreneurs and failing at that, and give opportunities to companies to, 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 to develop and thrive, to have this level, level playing field. And um, I, I, I think um, whether it's Egypt or Saudi Arabia, I think probably these things are probably similar. I don't know enough about Sudan to, to comment. Sorry about that. I, I, I know very well, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah. No, well, well, if I look, I mean, really, this was a, f a very interesting uh, dis discussion, and thank you for really giving us this uh, big picture view and allowing us to uh, uh, to uh, to learn from what the bank is, uh, is uh, how is the bank basically furthering its uh, its uh, analysis of countries and informing its own policies for uh, uh, for advice and uh, and and support to these countries. And thank you all for your time and for your interest. And uh, please stay in touch. And thank you again for joining. Thank you, Alida.